So if you don't have your Bible, we have plenty on the back shelf. Galatians chapter 4. I said Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. This is God's word. Would you all pray with me? Lord, this is our season of thanksgiving, but we know that that season for us should be daily, minute by minute. Lord, forgive us for not being thankful. Forgive us for letting our circumstances overshadow what we should be thankful for. Because you have all things well in your hand, Lord. You are sovereign over all things. Time, space, the world we live in, all of it, Lord, is, is at your feet. And uh, you uphold all your creation, Lord. And we just thank you for that love, that covenant love that you especially have poured out for us in, in coming down and doing something about our human condition, Lord. Just thank you for calling us together and, and more than just a body of people coming together on a Sunday morning, Lord, but as a family to love one another, Lord. That's what you've commanded us to do. So help us, help us be thankful, Lord. So, Father, you know our hearts. Change us, change our desires that we might put you first in all things, others before ourselves, and not to worry about the rest because it is all in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's our outline for these four weeks. We've been going through a series on Thanksgiving, and this morning we want to focus on part three, uh, praying with Thanksgiving. So my job as a pastor is to equip you all, and uh, how many of you know that we're in a war? It's kind of hard for American Christians to think that way because we're fairly insulated from a lot of adversity that many of our brothers around the world are experiencing. But we are in a spiritual battle. We have a real spiritual enemy and we have spiritual weapons. Uh, one of my jobs is to equip you in this battle. And in our series on Thanksgiving, I, I'm trying to equip you with Thanksgiving. We want to tuck that in your backpack because you need that to overcome those little fiery darts that you experience the tendency and uh, proclivity to grumble and complain about every little thing. And yet we have so much to give thanks for. And so the purpose of these lessons is to equip God's people and remind us to the importance of giving thanks. This is not a small issue. This is something that we need to focus on. It's a big part of your worship. It's a big part of your Christian testimony. So this is, this is important stuff. We put out a challenge last week to each day give thanks for five new things. How, how's that going? Are you doing it? Emery and I, we, we don't want to uh, tell everybody else what to do and not do it ourselves. So we've been doing that and um, last night, I have to confess, I, I tiled my son's backsplash in his kitchen, and I, I was fried when I got home. And I, I ate and climbed into bed, and I was lying there. I said, honey, can you do all five? <laughs> and she lifted up five beautiful Thanksgivings uh, on behalf of both of us. But that's important. Uh, I mean, five really isn't enough, but it's a starting point. Today we want to talk about praying with thanksgiving. And um, we'll look first of all at just the fact that God would listen to our prayers is an astounding thing. And then we want to look at the uh, elements of effective uh, prayer and look at one uh, neglected element. Psalm chapter 8, verses 2 through 4. The Lord... Uh, has inspired the psalmist, and he writes this, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have displayed your splendor above the heavens. 
When I consider the heavens, the work of your hands, the moon, the stars, which you have made, what is man that thou art mindful of him? I mean, that's a great question. Considering how great God is and how comparatively small we are, it is an amazing thing that God would condescend to hear our prayers, and yet he does. God is almighty, and I'm made out of dust. That God would listen to my prayers is an unfathomable, incomprehensible condescension. I think one translation says that God stoops low to behold the things on earth. I mean, that's a... uh, anthropomorphism, it's thinking of God in in human terms. God doesn't have to stoop. He's omnipresent and omniscient, but we get the idea that that there's a, a lowering, a condescending of God to interact with us. Not only does God hear our prayers, but he commands us to pray. And here is one of those commands. Call unto me, the Lord says. And I will answer you. I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. I wanted to go through the elements of effective prayer because sometimes we just get lazy and we pop off a laundry list of of needs and tack on a little catchphrase at the end, in Jesus' name, amen, and think that we've actually prayed to God. And That's so irreverent, and and we're all guilty of that, me too. We treat God like some kind of cosmic vending machine. We pop off our prayer, pull the handle, and expect our answer. But God wants us to pray first and foremost because he wants to develop a relationship with you. And again, that's an amazing condescension that God would want a relationship with me. But he does. That's the hallmark of Christianity. We have a relationship with our creator. And so he even creates needs and adversity in your your life so that you will talk to him. Because you know yourself when things are going smooth, how's your prayer life? Kind Kind of falls off a little bit. But when you're in the heat of the battle, you know how passionate You cry out to the Lord, help, Lord. God wants you to talk to him. So here are some elements of prayer. And there are probably others, but I think this pretty much covers what the Bible says is essential for prayer. First of all, you must be born again. Proverbs 15, 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. And by sacrifice, it is implied there anything that has to do with with man-made religion, whether it be the worship to their man-made gods or praying or whatever. All that included in that statement. And it says there that those are an abomination to the Lord. To the Lord. Now, that's not a, a word that we use too much anymore, uh, I don't think. Um, you would say, these, these eggs are an abomination. <laughs> <laughs> we just don't talk like that. So what does that word mean? Well, it, it means something that's detestable or disgusting. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to God? Yeah. Their prayers are an abomination. Yikes. I mean, that's, that's what the word says. The rest of that verse goes on to say, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. What a contrast. The prayers of those who are involved in man-made religion are detestable, but the prayers of God's people are delightful. I mean, you can't get a bigger contrast than that. God delights in the prayers of his people. And there's a picture of this in the Jewish tabernacle. 
and that's pictured in the fragrant aroma as incense was ignited on that golden altar of incense in the Jewish tabernacle, we are told in scripture that that is a picture of the prayers of the saints. Interesting little picture. So in that tabernacle, and when uh, Solomon built his temple, uh, all of the pieces and, and the facility itself were magnified several uh, times. But uh, that golden altar of incense was right up against the veil. And the veil separated the two interior compartments of the Jewish tabernacle. There was the outer courtyard where any Jew could go. But then there is the holy place where only the priest could go. And then separating that from the holy of holies was this veil. And only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. And even then, only once a year on the Day of Atonement, what is called today Yom Kippur, and there he would make a sacrifice for the sins of the people. Inside that Holy of Holies, you know, was the Ark of the Covenant. And that was a, another symbol. It was a picture of the throne of God. And there between the outstretched arms of those cherubim that were carved in acacia wood and covered in gold, there the Shekinah of God. People say Shekinah glory. That's redundant because Shekinah means glory. There the glory, glory of God would dwell between the outstretched arms of those cherubim and, and God would meet with the high priest. Again, a, a manifestation of God that he provided, but we know that God fills the heavens. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere, but he would, he would manifest himself in that particular place to the high priest. So we have this beautiful picture. On one side of the veil is this golden altar of incense, a picture of the prayers of God's people ascending as a fragrant aroma. And on the other side of that veil was the throne of God. And the, the, the picture then is, is very clear that our prayers, the prayers of God's people exclusively ascend as fragrant incense, a fragrant aroma before the throne of God. I mean, that, that's a beautiful picture. Would you think of your prayers that way? I mean, I think of my prayers as kind of feeble. That's not the way God looks at your prayers. To him, he delights in your prayers. To him, they're like a fragrant aroma, like that golden altar of incense. It says later on in Exodus, after describing how to build that golden altar of incense, it says, make sure, though, you don't offer any strange incense on this altar. Well, what was that? Anything that was a different type of incense than what uh, God had prescribed to be mixed together and burned on that altar. That's a strange little, little statement, but it's very descriptive. Uh, there's, there's an example of Aaron's own sons, Nadab and Abihu, offered strange incense on that golden altar, and fire came out from the tabernacle and consumed them. These were Aaron's own sons. You see, they thought they could worship God on their own terms. That's, that's the heart of man-made religion. I'll worship God how I want. Maybe I'll carve a totem pole and dance around that. And that'll just help me think about the God who created everything. Or, or I will carve a, a stone figure, and, and that'll be my representation of God. Or I'll make a golden calf. That'll help me remember that God is mighty. And God says, no. Make no images of me. Because any, any image that we make of God is infinitely less than who he is. And it, it confines our thoughts about God to something that is finite. And God says, you already have a wrong concept by making that image. But that's the heart of man-made religion. We'll worship God how we want. God says no. And he's deadly serious about it. So on the one hand, the 
incense from the golden altar is, is called elsewhere as sweet incense, a, a fragrant aroma, and here a strange incense. The sweet incense is a, a symbol of the, uh, the prayers of God's people. What would this strange incense be a picture of? Well, it's a, it's a symbol of the prayers of man-made religion, those who will do it on their own terms. And God says, I, I won't have any of that. It is an abomination to me. You can't worship me how you want. You must worship me according to my word. I'll tell you how I want to be worshipped. Access to God in prayer is possible only through Jesus Christ. And to that we must give a hearty amen. You say, well, that's rather mean-spirited, Pastor Steve. Listen, that's the nicest thing I could tell you today. If there's only one way to communicate to the creator of the universe, it would be mean to deceive you and say, listen, you can can talk to him whether you're a Christian or a Muslim or a Hindu or whatever. It really doesn't matter what you believe. He's the God of all religions. No, he's not. I know that's a narrow message, and you might be called narrow-minded, but we'll accept that. It's amazing that God would provide any way of access to him, because by all rights, because the wages of sin is what? Death, and not just physical death, spiritual, eternal death. By all rights, the whole human race should go straight to hell. But God, not willing that the whole human race should perish save for himself a people, has given us faith to believe. He's granted repentance to these old, sin-sick hearts of ours. And it's our prayers, because we believe in Christ. He even gave us the faith to believe in his Son. And it's only through his Son, who's the intermediary between God and man, the only intermediary, It's only through Christ that your prayers can be heard. But we must go through him. God rejects the prayers of those who reject his son. Again, that sounds narrow, it sounds mean, but we need to know that. I remember the the story of Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to uh, China and eventually started China Inland Missions. He was on a tugboat headed towards his destination in China and fog had just uh, socked in the river. They they could barely see to drive the boat. The the ship captain was so afraid. He said, uh, Mr. Taylor, can we get together and pray that God would lift this fog? And Taylor, I mean the audacity of this guy, great missionary, accomplished amazing things in missions in China. Taylor said to that ship's captain, they were down in in Taylor's room, he said, sir, you are not a Christian and God would not hear your prayers. I have already prayed that God would lift this fog and lo and behold, God did and they made it to their destination safely. But that just uh, is an example of what we're talking about here. God will hear the prayers of his people exclusively. You must be born again. You must be a Christian to have your prayers heard. The difference is between prayer that God detests and prayer that God delights. That's a big difference. So God rejects the prayers of those who reject his son. We said that the difference is between prayer that God detests and delights. And lastly, the almighty that, I mean, the fact that he would delight in my prayers. That's craziness. You delight. I mean, sometimes I don't even know the right words to say. I'm stumbling for words. Sometimes my heart's so overwhelmed, I I can't speak but that he would delight to talk to you and and that we would not take advantage of that? How arrogant is that? That we 
little dirt balls made out of the dust of the earth wouldn't take advantage of this great opportunity that God would listen to our prayers. Christians, pray to your God because your God is the only one listening to prayer and he's the only one that can do anything about what you ask. So pray, Christians. We must be born again. Number two, we have to have a clear conscience. So after you're born again, being a Christian, you still must maintain a clear conscience. First John says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, why would your heart condemn you? Because of unconfessed sin. If our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. So as a Christian, you, you believe in Christ. You know the only way to pray is, is in Christ. You cannot entertain or hold on to your sins. You must do what we say more times than you care to hear. You have to keep short accounts with the Lord. As soon as you're aware of some sin in your life, confess it right then. The old Catholic model of waiting till the end of the week and confessing your sins to some earthly priest, that's just not going to do. Because you sin so much every day, you need to be talking to God all day long. God, forgive me for that ugly thought. Lord, fix this too. That my attitude's horrible. Lord, I, I did the right thing there, but you know my motives were all messed up. Lord, forgive me. And we're confessing our sins regularly to the Lord as soon as we're aware of them, You're maintaining that clear conscience. Here's a couple of examples. David, the man called uh, a man after God's own heart. David says, if I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Holy smoke. So if God's not going to listen to the man after his own heart because of some wickedness he hasn't repented of, he's not going to listen to your prayers if you have some sins you're holding on to. Those little pet sins you think are so cute and adorable, they're, they're hurting your prayer life. Here's another example. Guys, check this out. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Say what? Is it possible, gentlemen, that your harsh words to your wife have blocked your prayers to God? She is a fellow heir of grace. You're to treat her that way. And when you don't, you need to confess that as a sin, talk to God about that, and then you need to go talk to her. Otherwise, your, your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling. The sound waves are bouncing off and coming back, and that's as far as they get. Some of you husbands, your prayer life stinks because of this. You've mistreated that sweet lady that God gave to you. Fix that and then pray to God. The prayers of God's own children are blocked by unconfessed sin, but it's easy to fix that. Confession and repentance restore our access to God in prayer. So number one, you have to be born again. Number two, you have to have a clear conscience. And number three, you have to believe in the God that you're praying to. James 1, verses 6 and 7. Ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea. And we know all about that here in Virginia Beach. Driven and tossed by the wind, for that man ought not to expect he will receive anything from the Lord. Hebrews 11, without faith, it is impossible, not just kind of hard, it's impossible to please God for those that come to him must believe that he is and that he's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Jesus said something very interesting. He, he said, you know what? If you have prayer as, as big as a mustard seed and he deliberately picked the smallest seed 
that there is. It's like a little grain of sand. Why did he pick such a little seed? If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move, and it will move. The point is, it's, it's not so much dependent on you, but it's dependent upon your understanding of the one you're talking to because he's infinite. No matter how little your faith is, even as small as a mustard seed, that's the first number there in the equation. The other side of that is God. And anything times infinity is what? Infinity. You guys are so smart. <laughs> it's infinity. So trust in the Lord. Thing won't face so little. I know, but God's so big. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. You know, no wonder why Paul wrote that. I, I think the bottom line is, Christian, you're, you're, first of all, your concept of God is too small. Whatever your thoughts about God are, they're too small. He's bigger than you think. And he's able to do exceedingly, not just a little bit more than you ask or think, but exceedingly, abundantly more. Your faith is proportional to your understanding of God's greatness. Okay, since those two things are connected, how am I going to increase my faith? By understanding how great God is. And how am I going to learn that? Reading his word. The more you understand about the God that you pray to, the more you're going to realize, oh my goodness, he's way bigger than I thought. And faith grows. Faith is believing that God is that nothing is impossible with God. Number four, pray with humble importunity. The two sides of the attitude of prayer. Number one, we're, we need to pray with humility. This whole nonsense about name it and claim it, uh, blab it and grab it, or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> that's just arrogance. You can't, do you know who you are? You can't tell God what to do. In, in the greatest sense of humility that you can muster up, you come before the Lord. Oh, Lord, please forgive me of my sins. And you name them. You are a great God. You're a mighty God. You're a good God. You're merciful. Please hear the prayer of your humble servant. We're not like Daniel prays. We're not praying on account of any merit of our own. But upon your great grace and love and mercy. We're appealing to the goodness of God, not some goodness in us. If you're basing your prayers, well, Lord, I've been good today. Come on. Come on now. Hear my prayer. That's just not going to work. Oh, Lord, you hear the desire of the humble and you incline your ear. <coughs> the second half of that is importunity. Again, another word we don't use a lot. But it means to, in theological terms, as it pertains to praying, it means to pray with perseverance and not giving up. If you're praying anything for the glory of God, according to his will, according to all these requirements that we're talking about this morning, Pray and don't give up. <coughs> Anne Marie, could you grab me a little water? <coughs> Here's a great picture of this in Genesis 32. It's a weird picture. Jacob meets this angel of the Lord, and we talked about that in our Genesis studies. That angel of the Lord is the Lord. It's a pre-incarnate visitation of God. Christ. What? Yeah, so, so here's Jacob wrestling with the Lord. And the, the, the day's about to break. Uh, daylight's about to break. Thank you, sweetie. And um, the Lord says, let me go. I mean, he didn't have to ask. <laughs> 
but he, he wants to see if Jacob's going to let go. And Jacob says, no, I won't let go until you bless me. So the Lord knocks his hip out of uh, its socket, ouch. And he lets go, but he, he does bless him. That's importunity. Lord, I won't let go until you bless me. Here's a verse that just, I don't know, it, I can't wrap my mind around it. In Hebrews it says, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears. I don't know if that verse wasn't in the Bible, if I would have thought of Jesus praying that way. He prayed with such passion, such fervency, such importunity. If your prayer life, and you have to be honest, if your prayer life's just kind of cold, you're just kind of going through the motions, you should confess that as sin. Because again, you're talking to the king of all kings. The creator of all things. And we're going to go, and I'm guilty of this just like you. We're going to go in half asleep. Oh, Lord, you know what I need. Wake up. Remember who you're talking to. Jesus was telling them parables to show at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. And here's two examples in the Gospel of, of Luke. You remember these two. The, the man who goes to his neighbor at midnight asking for bread. I wouldn't advise that. And the widow and the unjust judge. And that's an interesting one because the widow, because she kept hounding this judge, he finally gave her what she was asking for. And this was an unjust judge. And the connection we're supposed to make is, how much more will your God, who's a just judge, right. hear your prayers? If you will pray and not lose heart. Amen. Keep laying your petition before the Lord. If it's for his glory, then pray, Christian. Pray and don't lose heart. That's importunity. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Fervent prayer. Pray fervently. What's your prayer like? Would, would the Lord, you know, if he was right here, is like, yeah, not so fervent. Kind of, kind of sleepy, kind of cold, kind of in a hurry. I forget who said it, but one of the old Puritans said, Prayer is unhurried conversation with God. Man, I love that. I don't always do that. But, but what a great statement. Slow down. Sometimes we're, we're just rushing through it, especially when you pray before dinner, right? You're hungry. <laughs> Come on, Mom. Anne-Marie prays long prayers. And, and she's, she's our fast food prayer. So when she and I are in the car, we go through the little window and get our food. I'm driving, and we're on our way somewhere, so we've got to eat in the car while we're going, and she's got to do the prayer. And that girl, she just lets it fly. I mean, we're going blocks. We're halfway to our destination. We haven't even opened the bag yet. She's praying. I thought we were just going to pray about this food. She's praying about lost loved ones and the church. It's like, <laughs> don't stop. Don't stop. That's right. Just stop. Thomas Watson, another great old Puritan, said, Incense without fire makes no sweet smell. Prayer without fervency is like incense without fire. Your prayer needs to be ignited set on fire. There's got to be a little passion in it. A yeah. little feeling. I know prayer is not just feeling. It's not just emotions. You've got to pray with our brain. But neither is it devoid of 
real emotion. Prayer is the humble heart's recognition of our helplessness and God's mercy. Lack of fervency in prayer should grieve us and be confessed. All right. We need to pray with right motives. You ask and you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Chris Polk said something really great at adult Sunday school. You guys really need to come to adult Sunday school. You're missing out on a lot. A lot of good stuff that goes there. And mainly because we have this, this body of mature believers that are contributing to the conversation from their own experience, and we all have so much to learn from each other. And he said, you know, when you think about the way Jesus prayed, he really didn't pray about the physical needs of people. And we all said, well, that's true. He, he prayed for their spiritual needs. They were like sheep without a shepherd. They were lost and they needed their eyes open because they were blind. He prayed for their spiritual needs. That's not saying that you shouldn't pray for physical needs. The Lord says, bring everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Bring it all to the Lord. Little things, big things. Remember McLaren's statement, uh, the lady said after the sermon, you know, uh, Pastor McLaren, I, I, I pray for the little things and leave the big things to God. I mean, I do the little things and I pray for the big things and ask God to help me with those. And he said, Madam, to God, everything is little. <laughs> so pray for everything, not just the big things, but you need help with the little things. It's the, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine, right? And, and those little things you think were so little, man, they can wreck your day. They can wreck your marriage. All oh, the ways of a man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs the motive. So what's the ultimate motive in prayer? And I think Jesus himself prayed, Father, glorify thy name. That's, that's the, the ultimate motive. So, so I want you to think about what you're praying for right now. Are you praying that for your own needs to be met, you're praying that for God's glory. Now, it's possible that same thing that you're praying for, if you thought through it, you could pray for that to God's glory. You might be praying, Lord, please save my lost son or daughter because, you know, here I am a Christian in the church and uh, it's kind of embarrassing that I got kids that aren't saved. Well, who cares about your reputation? Instead, how about this? Lord, please save my lost child. Show yourself strong on behalf of my son or my daughter that you're stronger than their obstinance or their sin. Lord, be glorified in their salvation that you would be praised and lifted up. That even a stony heart can be won to Christ that another one might be added to lift up your praises and thanksgivings. Lord, do it for your glory. Christian, pray that way. So why we want things is, import, is as important to God as what we want. Why we want things is as important as what we want. Answers to prayer may be delayed while God purifies our motives. You might be praying for good things for the wrong reason. And so some things you've prayed for for years. Amory and I have prayed for some things for a couple decades. Why does God not just answer our prayer? Well, one reason might be that your motives are, aren't quite what they should be. And he's purifying your motives. And it takes time because your heart is full of all kinds of self. The desire for God's glory should be our ultimate motive. And then we have one last, 
next uh, element of effective prayer here in verse 6. Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So we, we know that the Bible says we're ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador is someone who represents the interests of another. The United States doesn't send an ambassador to a, a foreign country to represent himself. He's representing our country exclusively. He can't say, well, this is what the United States wants. But on the side, you and I can cut a deal. There's none of that. And we're ambassadors for Christ. We represent him. We're to pray for his interest. Weave that into your thoughts about prayer. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Here's the Lord's prayer. Thy kingdom come. Whose will be done? God's will. Thy will be done. That's, that's the way Jesus taught us to pray. Prayer is not to get our will done on earth. Well, that's a new piece of information. <laughs> we should be praying for those things that Jesus would pray for. It's for the accomplishment of God's will. Augustine said, make God's will your will and then ask whatever you want. That, that's pretty good. Where it says that in Psalm 37 in a different way. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. So again, we're ambassadors of Christ. We represent him. We should pray the way Jesus would pray and for the things that he would pray for. To pray in Jesus' name is to pray according to the word of God. That's not just a little phrase you add on to whatever you want to say. Lord, I need a bigger house, and a fancier car. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Come on. All right. Well, there is another element here. Actually, the whole sermon was just a lead up to this last point. And the seventh element of effective prayer is thanksgiving. And we so often just leave that out. Back to our verse that Chris read, be anxious for nothing, but, by, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And again, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. So remember that golden altar of incense. Thanksgiving is what makes our prayers sweet. There's a sour prayer. God, give me this now. God's not going to accept that. Thanksgiving gives our prayers access to heaven and an audience with the Almighty. There's, there's a couple great statements in Psalms. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. That's singled out. How do we enter the court's in heaven, through the mighty throng of angels, the myriads and myriads of angels around the throne of God. How do we break through all that, past the cherubim, into the very presence of the Almighty? Here's one of the keys. Thanksgiving. Enter his gates with thanksgiving in his courts with praise. That makes it into the immediate presence of the Lord. Try this on this week. Bathe every prayer for what you need. Bathe every prayer for what you need in thanksgiving for what you already have. You know, uh, Chris is right. So many times we take prayer requests and, and then we never give thanks for when the prayer is answered. That, that's just wrong. Bathe your current needs and requests in thanksgiving for what God's already done for you. You know that little acronym that uh, people use, ACTS, the Acts of Prayer, A-C-T-S, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication. First of all, I think the adoration and thanksgiving go at the front end of that. If, if maybe confession goes first, confess our sins, then praise God and give him thanks, 
I don't think until you've done those three that your heart's even ready to ask for anything. Confess your sins. Praise God and give thanks to his wonderful name, how, how much he's already done for you, how many things he's blessed you with. <sighs> now my heart's ready to ask for this new request. I've realized how great God is. My faith has been enlar enlarged by praising him, thanking him for what he's already done. I have a new attitude to ask with humility and thanksgiving, placing my request before the Lord. See if God will not hear your prayers and if your prayers aren't more efficient when you pray the right way. Let's stand. He who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. Heavenly Father, help us in these things, O oh Lord. We've heard the requirements in your own word for effective prayer, and we want to pray this way. We want uh, our prayer life with you to be close and full of passion. We know you want communion with us, and, and so... You talk to us through your word and we talk to you in prayer. And I have to say, sometimes we're kind of lazy on both of those. We don't read your word and our prayer life sometimes is pretty poor. So I pray, Father, that we would take these things to heart, that your mighty Holy Spirit would stir up our hearts. The importance of effective prayer being born again, having a clear conscience, right motives, pray with thanksgiving. Dear God, help us in these. We are weak, but you are strong. So help us, transform us into the image of your son. Help us to pray the way your son would pray, we ask in Jesus' name.